Hi there, this is Alfie Wattam, London's tech recruiter and the host of the London Tech Talks podcast. Uh, today I'm speaking to Andrew Martin, an expert on AI, and we're going to be covering a few different topics. Um, thanks for joining us, Andrew. Can you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm the uh, secretary of the AISB, which is the, um, the oldest AI society in the world, uh, mostly UK based, with a few hundred members. Um, I've uh, recently submitted a PhD on um, artificial intelligence in the area of swarm intelligence, um, focusing on an algorithm called stochastic diffusion search. And um, I'm currently CTO at a, uh, a start off that um, span off from a uh, um, AI lab that I was working in at Goldsmiths um, called Factory 60. And that's um, for e forensics um, and also uh, kind of. Uh, HR and HR management and e-discovery. It, it slurps up any data set that you can consider as a um, transactional data, data set okay. and uh, performs lots of metrics on the, the, the network on top of that. Brilliant. And you did touch upon it then, but could you tell us a little bit more about what you're currently working on and that sort of thing? Oh, yeah. So, um, well, Fact360 is an idea that... Um, arose um, from an observation. That's something I was learning when I was reading about Bletchley Park because um, I'm interested in anything AI. And so, of course, I was reading the uh, Alan Turing's biography. Yes. And that got me into um, reading more about what happened to Alan Turing when he was working as a code breaker in Bletchley Park. And um, his boss, um, Gordon Welshman, um, uh, wrote a book uh, about the, um, the experiences there. And whereas Turing was um, breaking the codes um, and, and designing all these methods to break codes, Gordon Welshman was looking at the intelligence they could glean um, before they broke the codes. So um, what you might call these days um, metadata analysis or um, what they called at the time log reading. So even though they didn't know the messages that were being sent um, in, in the continent, they could see that one a message was being sent from the same place at the same time every day yeah. um, and that hinted that it was a weather station yeah. and they could see that there was one uh, message that was um, uh, being uh, a group that was broadcasting and receiving from lots of different people and they were moving so there was clearly some kind of mobile HQ or something and so we're looking at performing the same ideas on, um, on uh, data sets such as uh, uh, communications um, uh, corporate emails, one for how we might use it for HR, but also for, um, as I said, e-forensics for kind of fraud analysis um, for, for huge data sets that you don't know where to start looking. Wicked. All right. So obviously on the idea of HR and, and recruitment, similar to what I do, um, in what ways could AI, at least theoretically, but in, in practical terms as well, and be used to carry out work that's been done traditionally by humans? You know, what, what kind of jobs do you think it could replace and, and that sort of thing? The jobs that um, the AI can replace are the, right now, the ones that they, they completely replace are the ones that need to be done by what I call like fanatical bureaucrats. Yes. So people that are absolutely obsessive about the procedure and uh, the, the truth is there's not an awful lot of those jobs in the world. Most of them require a little bit of human uh, ingenuity and a little bit of human you know, gut instinct, um, but also um, just um, a good feel for the situation. So whereas um, uh, like uh, HR might include, and, and recruiting might include lots of matching people up by their metrics to a job, by the jobs metrics, mm -hmm. um, there will always need to be a human to uh, realise if, if the model wasn't particularly right or if this job has been described in this way, it really doesn't capture a lot of the things uh, of that job. So I'd say um, AI is good for any job that's uh, got a huge amount of um, uh, uh, data or what you might call a vast search base. Um, but I would never want to leave AI entirely in charge of that yes. job. At yeah. least without a very strong appeals procedure. Yeah, absolutely. What about in terms of um, like industries or sectors? Are there any sectors which are um, sort of most interested in, in leveraging um, AI and, and the sort of opportunities that, that could be done around that? 
Certainly, if I'm going to suggest the two industries I think that are most interested in using AI, it would be military and mass surveillance. Okay. Um, I wish I had a more positive spin on that, but these are the two groups that uh, often um, aren't that uh, are, are less concerned about getting it right every time, and are more concerned about getting uh, uh, not missing any opportunities. You know, and yeah. they, they although. Let's say um, false positives will hurt both of them, but um, that, that's when you falsely identify something as, as, as a threat or an opportunity. But false negatives are going to be the ones that they really hate. So um, they are not going to want anyone to slip through their fingers or any opportunity to, um, to, to target someone to be refused, uh, to, to be missed. Um, and you, you always have to balance that. There's, there's no AI system and there's no industry that won't have um, to balance their false positive versus their false negatives, um, depending on the, the cost of each one. Yeah, and I guess on the, the negative side, um, obviously there are lots of benefits of, of AI and we've, we've listed them, but are there any potential downsides which could happen as a result of the AI revolution? Yes, the... the uh, biggest downside is um, uh, to borrow a quote. I think it was some, was it um, either from Margaret Thatcher or someone critical of Margaret Thatcher, saying that um, you can know the uh, the price of everything but the value of nothing. Yeah. Which is um, once you've once you've modelled your um, your jobs or your your actions and your your activities and you've you've evaluated one and picked the best, um, you'll only be um, picking things based on what you've decided are, are important. Um, so we, we, we can see it in anything. This isn't a new problem, really. Anytime there's a formal system, like matching someone for grades or something, uh, we all know that school grades don't capture someone's full aptitude. Um, I'm sure uh, any recruiter knows that there's um, lots of issues around the recruiting process, like um, are, are you really hiring the people that are just good at writing CVs or the people who've managed to crack the whiteboard interview? And um, so the, the 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 bad thing would be if there's any system that has been deployed that misses um, any, anything that becomes important sometime in the future. And unfortunately, humans are uh, squashy and um, complicated individuals, much more complicated than a game of chess or a game of Go. And so in, in one sense, you're always going to miss something um, because you, you can't evaluate the, the full complexity of a human. Um, and on the other hand, you're going to miss something because as soon as you do deploy a system that is um, evaluating on certain metrics, people find loopholes, <laughs> little things they can, um, uh, I guess you might call it like a, a, a dump stat where you can uh, put all your bad points in this area because they don't get recognized or focus entirely on this area because that's all you're being evaluated on. Um, and so you might get some very skewed people um, in a kind of, uh, if, it's, if it happens in the recruitment business. Um, yeah, there's, there's uh, these classic stories about even if you put someone in a, uh, or was it a, a pigeon, I believe, in a, in a box where food is coming randomly, um, they think that uh, any actions they did makes this food come through. So after a few drops of food, you might see these pigeons walking around in circles or jumping up and down and bobbing their head because of what they think the, this machine is doing. And you see a lot of this in um, discussions on YouTube and uh, well, mostly YouTube about referring to the algorithm like it's some capricious god. Yeah, interesting. All right. So a lot of people um, would say that AI has got the potential to become more intelligent than, than humans, um, and and that might get to a point where it's so more intelligent that it's not even comparable. Um, how do you think AI would behave in this situation? Well, I I kind of have to reject the. Uh, reject the, the notion that um, AI is um, uh, a, a bit intelligent and is about to get much more intelligent than us. I, I, don't, I don't think it's on the same scale at all. Yeah. Um, so the way I, t the, the, there's, there's, okay, there's two ways of answering this question. You can say whether a machine is really intelligent or not, let's say, uh, take for example, a self-driving car. It doesn't matter um, philosophically whether it was conscious or intelligence by whatever metric. All that matters, you might say, is just its, um, its performance in the driving 
in, in, in the job of driving itself. Um, but even more practical than that, what really matters is if it's going to get the okay from a politician or a local, uh, local dignitary. You know, who's going to say, okay, cars, cars get on the road. It doesn't matter really if they're intelligent or not, just whether they're allowed to be deployed. And then you'll see them acting in the ways that we, um, we can already see, but, but writ large, which is for the um, situations where everything is normal, they're pretty good and they can often be better than humans. But they, um, they'll have um, unpredictable behavior and often catastrophic behavior in the edge cases. And um, I, I, I forget the name, but there was at least someone, I think from Google working on the um, self-driving cars who just said the edge cases just keep on coming. <laughs> And it's because, like, unlike us, they don't have a feeling for the situation broadly. Yeah. Um, and people might argue that things like neural networks give you that, but um, it, it's, it, you still see this um, failure in the edge cases and catastrophic failure, the, the, the edgier these cases get. Yes. So there is, there is a, the, the second way of answering this question is, is there is something. The, the, I, I don't believe there's anything... Um, um, magical per se about yeah, yeah. intelligence so there must be some way of building a thing that can do things like us um i don't believe it's software um and there's there's a very different a big difference in my mind between the thing that's controlled by software controlling its body like a like a marionette like a puppet and something that um has a body in a world and has got its own lived experience um and its own um uh, partial autonomy because of course we're not but we're as guided by the culture and the environment as, as we are our own brains. Yeah. So there's, there's nothing to stop someone building that as far as I'm aware. And that's, that's one of the areas of AI I'm interested in why I've followed um, swarm intelligence. Um, yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's more of a, it's a better way of thinking about these things rather than complicated algorithms in the head. And I believe that that, that project um, is valuable. We're only on minimal cognition now. But you could build a thing that has human-like intelligence. But the problem is, once you have built a thing that's um, at least as intelligent as a human, because it's, it's had the same kind of experiences over 20 years, um, and it is as adaptable because it's had education and its own experiences, the thing that you build isn't going to want to do a silly image recognition task 24 hours a day. It's, it's it, just like us. It's going to want to travel. Um, or write a book or, or see what it can produce. So it's going so to turn it on itself and, and become um, self-aware, do you think? Well, yeah, if, that, that, that's, it's, that, that, there's a, a phrase called like Turing complete. If you have one thing, you've got to have all these other things. And so if you want something to be um, adaptable and have an intelligence, anything like humanity, um, as opposed to say, saying like, oh, a calculator is more intelligent than a human because it can do bigger sums. If you want it to be, um, yeah, adaptable and uh, yeah, broadly intelligent, general intelligence, they're calling it. Um, you're going to need to also bring with it the fact that it's going to refuse to be obedient entirely, like any teenager would, um, or, or have its own um, biases built in but from its um, uh, lived experience. And so, yeah, so, so there's the way it'll be different. It's either going to be this, this fanatical bureaucrat that follows all the rules, even if it's catastrophic, or it's going to be something very much like us that's, um, that's going to need breaks and holidays and so on. Yes, interesting. Wicked. Well, thank you so much, um, Andrew, for your thoughts, ideas, insights and, and ideas and everything. Um, that was really useful and, and insightful and I definitely learned a lot and hopefully everybody watching did as well. Um, I'll tag you on LinkedIn when it comes out in a couple of days so people can reach out if they've got further questions um but thank you so much for your time again and thank you to everybody for, for watching okay no problem uh, but my pleasure thanks